right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to both everyone here in the room and those attending virtually to the last day of the RIC. It's great to see so many smiling, happy people here joining us to talk about long-term operations for power reactors in our session entitled Long-Term Operations, Meeting the Moment. My name is Brian Smith, and I am the director of the Division of New and Renewed Licenses here at the NRC. Our division leads the licensing reviews for license renewals and new plant licensing for light water SMRs. Uh, with me today is John Wise, Flavian Simone, Haruku Sasaki, and Jinho Lee. Let's see if we can get, there we go. So as I said, this session is titled Long-Term Operations, Meeting the Moment. Here in the US and across the world, as the power reactors age through their original license and into long-term operation, we have seen various degradation issues arise. According to the IAEA, about two-thirds of the global fleet, global reactor fleet of 413 reactors is over 30 years old. Specifically, here in the U.S., for the fleet of 94 reactors, 90 have exceeded 30 years of operation, 54 have exceeded 40 years, and with our oldest reactor having been being operated for 54 years. We've been busy for many years now with evaluating license renewals in the U.S. Only nine reactors still have their 40-year licenses. 78 have been initially renewed for 60 years, and six have been subsequently renewed for up to 80 years, with many more under review right now and, and many more applications expected. Luckily, we are not in this alone. International cooperation continues to serve a valuable role in long-term operations. Through this, we were able to share operating experience and emerging issues with our foreign partners, like we have with us here today. We are able to leverage research programs and share best practices in aging management and regulatory strategies. We do this through bilateral engagements, uh, such as on Monday when we met with Flavian to talk about thermal embrittlement of cast austenitic stainless steel. And on Friday, we are going to meet with Haraku to discuss PWR coral barrel cracking and stress corrosion cracking. And we've had ongoing discussions uh, with Jinho and Kins uh, throughout the year. We're also active in ongoing multilateral programs, including the IAEA's IGAL program and the NEA OECD Working Group on Integrity and Aging of Components and Structures. Also note that here in the U.S., we are currently updating our SLR guidance with a planned issuance date of January 2025. Uh, we plan to have a public meeting uh, next month in April to discuss how we resolve the public comments on the draft documents. So look for that notice uh, coming out before long. And lastly, uh, research, our Office of Research, uh, will be conducting a workshop this fall on planning for research for operating beyond 80 years. So if you're interested in that, uh, please stop by and see one of us uh, after the session. So in this session, we'll dive into aging degradation issues that have occurred during long-term operation. This session will discuss case studies about different types of aging degradation that may impact long-term operation and the approach to addressing the issue. Each case study will provide some background on the aging degradation issue identified, describe the regulatory approach to evaluating the issue and actions to address it, and discuss any lessons learned from this experience, including any research or regulatory process actions that have been taken or are being considered. Following the presentations, we'll have a few predefined questions for the panelists, which will be followed by audience Q&A. So a few notes about Q&As. But first, since this is the first session of the day, please remember to silence your electronic devices. The Q&A portion of this session will be through electronic means for both the virtual and in-person attendees. Uh, for those of you in the room here, uh, you may have scanned the QR code from the displays out in the foyer, but if not, please take a moment and scan the QR code you'll see up on the screen. Uh, you'll then be redirected to the specific session page for Q&A. For those of you joining virtually, once you've logged on to the virtual conference platform and joined the session, there is a tab for electronic Q&A. Okay. So I have four speakers with me today on the panel. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, John Wise. Dr. Wise is a senior technical advisor in the NRC Division of New and Renewed Licenses. He supports the resolution of technical and regulatory issues on a broad variety of materials topics with particular emphasis on long-term plant operation and aging management. His career at the NRC has also included positions as a materials technical reviewer 
for reactors and spent fuel storage and transportation systems. Prior to joining the NRC, John held metallurgical engineering positions in the steelmaking industry and in failure analysis consulting. He is a graduate of Michigan Tech and Northwestern Universities. Our second speaker will be Flavian Simone. Mr. Simone studied mathematics and fundamental physics at Ecole Polytechnic in France. After graduating from this school, he decided to join the French Civil Administration. He first became chief of a risk prevention department and a French regional administration, his team being responsible for the control of the hazards caused by industrial activities and their impact on the environment. He then joined the French Nuclear Safety Authority, ASN, becoming the deputy director and later the director of the Pressure Vessels Division. In this division, they oversee the control of all matters related to the design, manufacturing, and operation of pressure vessels and piping in civil nuclear sites. In the recent years, they have been particularly involved in the control of the manufacturing of the equipment of the EPR and EPR2 types of reactors, the stress corrosion cracking issue, and the aging of reactor pressure vessels and cast stainless steel components. Our third speaker will be Ms. Haruku Sasaki. Ms. Sasaki is currently a Deputy Director for Planning and Coordination in the Regulatory Standard and Research Division in the NRA in Japan. She has been with the agency for 10 years and supports the technical evaluations of the codes and standards and coordinates the public meetings related to the various technical issues. She was a Vice Chair of the Codes and Standards Working Group of MDEP and a member of the Working Group on Codes and Standards of the CNRA. Our last speaker will be Jin Ho Lee. Dr. Lee serves as a senior advisor at KENS, the Korea Institute of Nuclear Safety. He joined KENS in 2000 and has held various key management and leadership positions, including executive vice president from 2018 to 2021 and director of safety research division. He also served as the heads of four different departments, including international project management, international cooperation, mechanical and materials engineering, and legal affairs and safety standards. For 12 months, starting in May 2004, he visited the Argonne National Lab and performed joint research on steam generator tube integrity. Dr. Lee served as a member of the IEA Commission on Safety Standards, a Nuclear Safety Standards Committee from 2018 to 2023. Before joining KENS, he served in the military as a professor in mechanical engineering department of the Korea Military Academy. He received bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in mechanical engineering from Sun Kyu Kwan University in the Republic of Korea. All right, our first speaker today will be John Wise. Uh, the topic of managing selective leaching during long-term operation. Yep, I have the clicker. <clears throat> good catch. Thank you, Brian, uh, and good morning. Um, this morning I'm gonna explain the NRC's approach to um, addressing emergent aging issues in long-term operation. And as Brian uh, outlined in one of his first slides, the idea is to walk through this uh, case studies. And so what I'm gonna do this morning is I'm gonna use selective leaching, uh, the aging mechanism, as an example of, um, of how we work through an immersion aging issue. You know, this so I'll talk a little bit about the background of this particular uh, aging mechanism, but then um, discuss how the NRC, you know, take such an issue to evaluate it, uh, assess its implications for the wider industry, and then make decisions about whether or not that um, experience needs to be shared more broadly, or, or whether our regulatory programs need to be adjusted. So first, uh, just a couple of minutes on selective leaching to, to bring everybody up to speed on this aging mechanism. This is a, a a generic term, um, it's often go it goes by many other names as well. Uh, it's very frequently referred to as de-alloying. Uh, there are also very specific terms that uh, are used when you're talking about a, a particular material, uh, usually in the, in the case of cast iron, just to be called graphitic corrosion, and you can see the other terms there listed. Uh, De-aluminification, for example, for copper-based alloys. Uh, but what all of these uh, mechanisms have in common, regardless of the material, is the feature that it, it, it represents a corrosion mechanism where um, basically you have a galvanic cell where one part of the microstructure acts as a sacrificial anode to the other part of the microstructure. And so if you look at that example of uh, cast iron and that uh, graphic on the bottom, 
uh, in that case, the, the iron matrix of cast iron sacrifices itself for the graphite flakes in the microstructure. And so in the case of um, cast iron in particular, what makes this a particularly uh, challenging degradation mechanism is, is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, it, it, it can take a long time to show up. So you may have decades even of experience um, and, and without any, any uh, indication that anything is happening, um, but then it emerges uh, later on uh, after many years. And so recognizing that and, and planning for that in our aging management strategy is always uh, something we have to take in, uh, keep in mind. And the other part about uh, this mechanism, again, in, in the particular case of cast iron, is um, you, can, you can get a significant um, loss in the structural integrity of a component without any really any visual indication that that has happened. In that picture there, um, you, you see a, I took that picture, and it was, it's, a, it's of a cast iron pipe and municipal gas main. And um, I can tell you that there, you can see the rupture there, and the, the pipe itself essentially lost all structural integrity. It didn't have any toughness. But looking at putting your hand on that pipe uh, and even wrapping on it with your hand, uh, you'd think it was a solid pipe. But in fact, most of the iron matrix in that cast iron had been converted to iron oxide, and it really didn't have any structural integrity. And that makes it a, a particularly hard um, uh, aging mechanism to, to uh, to manage, just, just given that uh, lack of visual indication. Um, uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I'm, I've got to tell myself the next slide. <laughs> Come on, Brian. <laughs> yeah, like, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, just very briefly, um, we've had, uh, here's some, some examples of operating experience over the years associated with this particular aging mechanism. In the United States, the experience tends to be uh, uh, associated with cast irons, but you see aluminum bronze is, is also uh, one of the materials that this occurs in, we've had experience in. In that particular case, the, uh, the aluminum is lost in the material. Um, uh, due to the selective leaching mechanism. And I'm, my intent is to go through one by one, but just recognize that you know, we've experienced, uh, seen, seen instances of selective leaching over the years, and in those cases where um, we felt that the, the, the experience was uh, warranted a broader communication, you will see those, no, those indications of an information notice or IN numbers at the bottom. And that, that's, th those are cases where we felt that the experience was uh, significant enough that we as a regulator felt that we needed to issue a communication to the broader industry for their awareness. Um, and finally, on, on the far right hand side, we, we talk about the experience in the nuclear industry, but uh, it's really the non-nuclear operating experience in many cases is the most telling and most uh, helpful for us to learn about this aging mechanism because uh, the le selective leaching of cast irons in, in water distribution systems in the United States, particularly the East Coast cities, have some really old uh, cast iron piping systems. They provide a lot of information that we use to inform how we address um, selective leaching in the nuclear area. So as, as with all instances of operating experience, um, the NRC through its operating experience program uh, goes through a number of steps. You know, we collect the operating experience uh, we, we review it, uh, assess the implications, the safety significance, um, applicability to whether the operating experience is unique to the plant or applicable to the wider industry. And then we need to make a decision as a regulator whether we feel that there is a need to broadly communicate this experience to the broader industry and whether or not our own regulatory programs need to be adjusted. So typically what's happened in the case of the selective leaching um, uh, mechanism. We've uh, obviously, case by case, you know, our, uh, our inspectors in the regions you know, handle the plant-specific issue in particular. 
but generically, we as, we've assessed that information, and as I showed in the prior slides, we've issued communications to the industry when we felt that it needed to be broadcast. And we generally have used these information notices, and, and that's just one of our communication vehicles that uh, you know, push the information out to the industry with the expectation that each plant will take that information and, and themselves evaluate it and consider whether or not it needs to um, uh, lead to specific actions at their plants. And we have different types of communications um, that we use. Information notices are one, but the different types of communications vary by uh, the type of information we wish to communicate and the expected actions uh, of the plant. And, and the, finally, the bullet down at the bottom is really what we're talking about uh, a great deal today is long-term operation. And when we, when we talk about long-term operation, we're usually talking about aging management programs. And so we look at this operating experience and determine whether or not our own guidance for aging management needs to be revised. And so, and that indeed has happened. Um, I, I don't want to get into all the details of this, of this slide, but just broadly, we have our generic aging lessons learned report, which provides example acceptable approaches to manage aging. And we have a program that um, we provide in our uh, Gall report. And that program has, been, has evolved over the years as we've learned more about this particular aging mechanism. Uh, the blue boxes represent our initial license renewal or 40 to 60 year guidance. Uh, the orange yellow box is our subsequent license renewal guidance for 60 to 80 years. And as you can see early on, this program was one time inspection. You did once when you entered year 40, uh, you know, 40 plus at your plant, you selected a sample of components at your plant to determine whether or not, uh, really to verify that this wasn't an issue at your plant. That is the program. And you can see there's a, it had a combination of visual inspections, but as we already discussed, you need to do some sort of mechanical dis inspections as well to really understand the um, structural component of this me uh, aging mechanism. But what we've learned and what we've seen at the, at the prior slides was uh, we're kind of beyond, in many materials, just uh, verifying that it, selective leaching isn't happening. Because in, in many cases, for particular materials in particular environments, we know it is happening. Um, and so over the years, and as you go to the right-hand side, side of the page, our aging management approach has moved from a one-time inspection to verify it's not happening to periodic inspections now, where we're really managing an aging mechanism in many cases we uh, expect to happen for specific materials and environments. But th that's, that's our generic guidance. And plant by plant, there may very well be uh, plant-specific considerations where that generic guidance doesn't work. And so, in the, and, and so in this particular case study I'm, I'm showing here in this slide was a plant that was coming in for initial renewal, 40 to 60 years. They had a significant history of selective leaching of aluminum bronze. And you can see the, the huge uh, population of castings and welds that were uh, considered susceptible to this aging mechanism. And as I said in my prior slide, the 40 to 60 year recommended program was really just a one-time inspection to verify that it's not happening. Obviously that's not appropriate in this particular case because it was happening. And so in this particular case, the, the NRC staff had to work with the applicant to uh, come up with a program uh, to uh, address the fact that it's, it is happening and, and there's a very large population. And this included, uh, as you can see, a whole host of, um, of approaches taken from visual inspections on, most, uh, on a large population of components to uh, more intensive investigations, destructive ultrasonic on a, on a smaller sample size. And so this represents a case which you know, happens occasionally where, you know, our own recommendation, generic recommendation, just uh, isn't appropriate. And, and in this case, we, we'll work with the applicant to, uh, to figure out the appropriate approach going forward. So broadly, um, just the takeaways. Um, 
you know, the NFC, we, we provide, you know, we've used operating experience to refine our recommended aging man management approach and, and it has evolved over the years to become stronger, particularly in the cases where uh, aging degradation is expected. Uh, but plant-specific approaches often will still need to be used. Um, ongoing activities, um, as Brian mentioned in, uh, in his opening, we are currently have a few revisions to this particular aging management program in our, in our Gall Report guidance that's, um, out, uh, that's draft that we're evaluating the comments right now. And that includes a couple of um, uh, uh, smaller adjustments to the program to take into account new information that we've learned. And, uh, and secondly, um, we have had discussions with uh, the industry, particularly NEI, about potential uh, taking a different look at this program uh, where uh, risk information might be brought into consideration to um, uh, perhaps uh, focus resources, I guess I'll say, on those areas that are most risk significant. And that's an that's a ongoing uh, conversation we've been having with the industry for the last few years, and, and, uh, and so that will continue. And so with that, uh, that's it for me. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll, ta I'll turn it over to Flavian. Thank you. So uh, good morning. The, the topic I'm going to, to talk about is the uh, degradations we faced in France on some uh, cast uh, stainless steel elbows of our main coolant lines. So yeah, if I go over here, uh, on our oldest type of reactors, which uh, as some of you may know are of a similar design uh, as some Westinghouse uh, power plant uh, designs, pressurized water reactors that they are. We have some elbows that are outlined in, in blue in the figure that were made of uh, cast uh, stainless steel in, in the 70s and in the, in the 80s. And some of them were made in a particular steel with a high molybden content that is particularly subject to some thermal, uh, thermal aging mechanism. Uh, and the, the, the phenomenon is called uh, thermal uh, embrittlement. And it is because uh, this type of steel, uh, which is a duplex steel, is made of two phases. One is a nostenitic phase, the other being a ferritic phase. And uh, the ferritic phase is subject to embrittlement under the influence of the temperature the, the plant is uh, facing during the normal operating conditions. There is, a, in fact, a decomposition of this uh, ferritic phase in two phases. And Basically, and the, the, the impact uh, of this uh, decomposition is that the, the mechanical behavior is modified and the, the toughness is dramatically reduced over time uh, because of this uh, embrittlement. And so the, the, the rate at which um, it occurs is depending, uh, obviously, on the temperature of the plant, but also uh, it's depending on the concentration of some of the um, chemical elements within the steel such as uh, chromium, molybden, or silicium. There are other elements that have an impact. And as you see on, on the right, I displayed um, the impact on uh, Sharpie impact strength. And uh, the values are evolving uh, up to uh, a lower bound value that is reached for in normal uh, temperature conditions after um, maybe 100,000 hours of operation, maybe uh, 200,000 hours, that is the, the order of magnitude. And, if, uh, and I gave you also the, um, some toughness values that were measured uh, in the 80s on some uh, aged material, some material that was aged uh, in laboratory. And these were as low as 20 to 30 kilojoule per square meter, which is obviously very low. Uh, the, the, the toughness that we expect for currently the EPR reactors on the main coolant lines, it's above uh, 100 uh, kilojoule per square meter on the wells, and it's even more for the base material. And the, the other issue was that uh, in the 80s, uh, there were some big flows that were detected um, on the cast elbows of the, the main coolant lines. There is a, 
uh, a picture on, on the right showing uh, one of those flows that was discovered by Framatome in the 80s. And the, the, the problem with these flows was that they were not found during the uh, non-destructive examinations that were conducted by the manufacturer. They were found uh, by EDF just before the start of, the, of those plants. So the, it raised a concern for the ISN because we were knowing that the, the material was subject to a degradation that was impacting its toughness a lot and that there could be a risk of some flaws uh, that were not discovered by the manufacturer and kept uh, within the material. So the, the, the action of, of the ISN at that time was to ask our licensee, EDF, to assess the impact that it could have on the structural integrity of those elbows by doing some fracture mechanics computations. And the first approach was uh, very conservative because we asked them to study uh, the impact of uh, what was called the reference flow. Uh, and the dimensions of these flows would be um, a dimension that would cover the size of the biggest flow that was detected uh, in the 80s on, on the elbows. And the, at that time, the, the toughness uh, values, they were... Um, they were determined using some first uh, formulas that were um, designed by EDF in order to try to predict the effect of embrittlement. And the conclusions at that time was that uh, an operating period of more than 10 years was justified, but obviously this is way lower than the, the amount of years we operated the, react the reactors now. So there were some further studies that were done and there were two things that were assessed by the, the ISN in the 90s. First, uh, considering the, the flow that needed to be considered in those fracture mechanics computations, we accepted to reduce the size of uh, this so-called reference flow. And the main reason behind that is that uh, the flows we can expect in a cast material are not as uh, harmful as, for example, uh, a fatigue crack, the, the fatigue cracks that are used uh, when determining uh, the toughness um, of a given material. So we accepted to use a reference flow that was, in fact, smaller in dimension that, than the, the, the flows that were observed in some of these elbows. And the, the other aspect was uh, that ISN uh, asked EDF to improve the way uh, fracture toughness was uh, predicted under the effect of embrittlement. So I gave uh, in, in the presentation some examples of the formulas that were used in the 1990s. They were derived from test material, mostly um, tests that were performed on some aged material, uh, material that was aged in, in the laboratory at different temperatures and for different aging times. and. Uh, the, the principle behind those formulas being that EDF could predict some values for Sharpie impact strength and then, using some empirical correlation, uh, try to predict the toughness of the material based on the predictions on uh, the impact strength. Uh, so that was the, the, the initial approach in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, the, the issue with that approach is, was that the, the formulas that were used at that time, they were not uh, taking into account uh, test material that was representative enough for long-term uh, operation. And uh, in the 2000 and 2010, we, we had reactors that were reaching 30 and even 40 years of operation. And the, um, the question raised by ISN was, uh, okay, can we uh, re reliably predict the toughness of those materials? Uh, up to maybe 60 years of operation because we were starting to think uh, about uh, about those those um, those 60 years of operation for for the French fleet, and so I sent asked EDF to launch a very important program. In fact, to to try to to revise those uh, toughness provision formulas to update them, taking into account. Uh, those extended time frames for, for operation. They, so so, so they, they conducted uh, some tests on more than, uh, I wrote, uh, 600 um, materials, I mean, um, samples of materials that were either harvested from some elbows that were in operation, or also some, you, they used also some, some material from the manufacturer that was aged uh, in the lab. 
And so with this bigger database, they updated the formulas, taking into account uh, a lot of input parameters, uh, one being ferrite content, because the, the ferrite content in the steel is impacting a lot uh, the, the final toughness, but also the concentration of uh, many chemical materials that was uh, available from the manufacturer. And so currently we have formulas that take into account all this manufacturing data, and that is at least supposed to predict the fracture toughness with a, a coverage of more than 80% of the test results, this value of 84% being the result of uh, the statistical approach we use in our fracture mechanics computations. So uh, at that time, ISN uh, did uh, its own assessment using uh, the, 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 the test material that was provided by EDF, uh, comparing it to the results of those formulas to check that, in fact, we were indeed covering more than 84% of the results. So the, the, the results were quite uh, satisfactory. The, the database was also covering uh, some samples that were aged uh, up to 200,000 uh, hours, which was enough to cover up to 60 years of operation. And so uh, with that, there were some new uh, fracture mechanics uh, computations that were performed and that showed that the, most of the elbows that are on the hot leg, that are the ones that are subject to the highest temperature, could be operated up to 60 years of operation. Uh, and the same uh, demonstrations were done on the other elbows that are exposed to colder temperatures. Uh, and most of them were also, also um, justified. The, the issue being that some elbows with the highest ferrite content could not pass those uh, fracture mechanic tests and therefore should be replaced uh, before the, this uh, 60 years um, time frame. Uh, this is the current, uh, the, the highest current concern for the ISN because some of these elbows are not easy to replace, uh, especially the ones that are directly welded to the RPV uh, due to high dose uh, constraints. And so our, our current perspectives on that is first to study uh, the opportunity to replace some, some of these elbows. It is kind of easy, I mean, it's never easy, but kind of easy to do for some of them that are not close to the RPV. It's way more complicated to do uh, on the other case. So that's something EDF, and uh, we agree on that, doesn't really want to, to do. Uh, so, so the other perspective is to improve the way we inspect those elbows to make sure that there are no flaws that would uh, threaten their structural integrity. I even though the, the toughness is low, if you don't have big flows, uh, the issue is not as high. Uh, the problem being that it's not easy to inspect uh, cast uh, stainless steel uh, because of the, the structure. Uh, for example, U UT waves um, penetration is not very good. Um, so there is currently some research to try to develop some process that would at least be good to uh, inspect the first 10 to maybe 20 millimeters uh, from the, the inner wall because that is the part that is subject to the highest stresses, for example, during uh, a low-key accident. And uh, other perspectives being, uh, being reviewed uh, at the moment by EDF and the ISN are using some new fracture mechanics hypothesis that would be less conservative, that would take into account in a more precise way um, the, the constraints that are generated by those flows and the, the, in, indeed at the moment uh, we are only using some toughness values that are determined on some standard uh, test samples that are in fact assessing uh, the toughness when you have a crack. Uh, we know that um, the type of flows that we have on cast stainless steel are not as harmful as cracks but it's very difficult to know what is the precise difference and how to quantify it. So this is some ongoing research. At the moment, uh, ISN still asks for some uh, conservative uh, fracture mechanics assessment. This is one perspective also. So just to say that this, in order to, to wrap this up, uh, this is not a new uh, degradation issue that we are facing. In fact, we were aware of it uh, since the 1980s. But the longer you operate the plants, 
And the more difficult it is to justify that you still have some margins uh, in the case of a degradation that, that is slowly um, decreasing the toughness of your materials. So the, the longer we operate and the more precise the, the justification or methods uh, have to be. <coughs> and this is the, um, the goal of ISN is to make sure that even if you get into more precise uh, physical models, uh, fracture mechanic methods, you're still conservative enough in order to, to maintain a, a high enough safety, uh, I mean, safe enough operating conditions. And I think that's it. So thank you for your attention. Good, mo good morning, everyone. Uh, my talk has two kind of topics. The first one is uh, current regulation revision in Japan, and the second one is recent topics related to long-term operation. And before Fukushima accident, there is no limitation of operation period, but after, after Fukushima accident, Japanese government defined the limitation as 40 years originally and could be added maximum 20 years by another approval. However, 13 years passed from Fukushima accident, only 12 nuclear, PWR nuclear power plants are operating, and some PWR plant and every BWR plant has been stopped during more than 10 years. So Japanese government made the new policy and the act related to reactor, uh, nuclear reactor was revised last year. Uh, current regulation period, as mentioned before, and after 2025, new operation period will be started. And the new operation period, uh, operation suspended period can be added after 60 years. Su operation suspended period means the period of conformance review of NRA, mainly. And operation period will be reviewed and approval of the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. Of course, new system for aging management will be done by NRA as uh, similar as before. Next is operating experience. First case is steam generator tube cracking at Takahama Unit 3. The tube material is TT600 alloy, and there are two kind of P technical issues. First one is PWSCC. In early 2000, PWSCCs were found in 21 tubes, and the licensee conducted short peening for, re for residual stress reductization. During 10 years, there, is no, there was no indication it's good. But during the next 10 years, PWSCC were found in four tubes, and the last year, more than one tube. Licenses investigate the cause and estimate that compre compressive stress was given to 0 0.2 millimeter depths at, in 2020s uh, shot painting, but estimated that SCC, which had reached deeper than 0.2 millimeter, has pro propagated. And the second issue is thinning. In 2018 and 2020, thinning due to repeated contact of a falling object and repeated contact of tube and tube were found. And in 2022, erosion by scale was found. The scale came from the water supply, 
and licensee cleaned up of the tube to reduce the falling material, uh, uh, reduce scale, and maintain high pH of the water supply uh, to prevent a new <coughs> scale. But however, in 2023, erosion by scale was found again. Currently, CAPCO plan to replace of CSD. Next one is IGSCC in PWR primary stainless steel piping at OI in its three. In 2020, significant indication was found in the, on the surface of the pipe. This is, this is a photograph of the cross section of the crack. The size was 3.6 millimeter depth and 6 millimeter length. So it's very big crack for us, and we were very surprised. And the licensee investigate the cause and estimate that the cause was excessive welding heat input, and the surface of the pipe was hardened, and the crack was occurred and propagated. Ah, sorry. In this case, uh, in further investigation is conducting now, and we in RA hear from the uh, licensee the result of the investigation every year. Third one is reactor shutdown due to rapid decrease of PR neutron flux at Takahama Unit 4. Uh, last year, the reactor suddenly shut down. And the licensee found that, sorry, <laughs> uh, cab connect cables, sorry, cables, put on the, the other cables, and the cables, ah, sorry. Cables are pulled, and soldering peeled off, and the cables disconnected. Of course, this case is uh, non-conformance of the construction, but why now? It takes more than 30 years from construction. So we think there is possibility of the degradation of the material, such as soldering. And the licensee will conduct the investigation of the penetration after replacement. First case is transformer damaged by Noto Peninsula earthquake in 2024. <coughs> On July this first this year, earthquake has occurred. It was magnitude 7.6. And the Sika nuclear power plant is located in the Noto Peninsula. And in the plant, two transformer was were damaged by the earthquake. And oh, sorry. Uh, connect, connective pipe was damaged, and insulation oil leaked from the transformer. This is a photograph at the time. These transformers were designed as a seismic class C component according to Japan Electric Association guide. Seismic class C is almost same as commercial grade, but Japan Electric Association code require to resist the 500 gallon earthquake. There is no measurement device around the transformers, so Hokuriku Electric Power Company is now simulating the earthquake intensity to investigate the cause of the oil leak. 
including these cases, operating ex experience is reported to the NRA commission, co committee meeting. It, it is held once a week, and the regulatory implementation plan is approved by NRA. Sometimes further investigation will be planned by licensee, and further investigation result is sometimes reported to a directory uh, NRA committee meeting, or sometimes reported to a technical information review meeting, and regulatory action is dis discussed. Uh, this is final page of my presentation, and this is my thought, and a course, maybe question. So based on my experience, what is a better method to correct important information? We correct information internationally from the other countries, regulatory body, and international organization, but some important op operating experience were not found from the information, but provided from international working group, uh, such as CODAP. So I think it means that uh, they are, uh, our correcting, uh, uh, cor correcting information method is not adequate. In fact, uh, I myself is a member of the correcting information team, so maybe my fault. <laughs> and the second is uh, se second is uh, uh, related to language barrier. The NRA emphasizes transparency and openness, and the licensee di disclose a lot of information, uh, including data photograph, figures, but most of the materials are written in Japanese and it is difficult to provide to the other countries. Third one is uh, related to traditional understanding. Uh, recent topics shows us that sometimes it is necessary to reconsider the traditional understanding. So this conference is a very good opportunity for me to, to share our experience. And I hope you get, provide me a good idea or good thought related to these uh, thought and questions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, share current experience on aging degradation in Korea with you. Uh, as of uh, March 2024, two nuclear power plants were permanently shut down in Korea, and five units are under construction, and 24 units, uh, 25 units are in operation. The average operating year uh, is uh, uh, 24 years. Uh, seven of them uh, is uh, operating, are operating more than uh, 36 years. This indicated that aging management is becoming more and more important in Korea. Uh, the upper uh, table shows the status of permanent shutdown in Korea. Uh, Korea Unit 1 were, was uh, operated for uh, 10 years uh, beyond its design life. And Warsong Unit 1 was uh, operated uh, for less than 10 years uh, beyond its design life. In any case, they were permanently shut down for a political reason, not safety reasons. Uh, after uh, changes in uh, energy policy uh, for uh, continued operation, uh, Seven nuclear power plants applied for continued operation these days. Uh, and it is expected that 
uh, 10 to 12 nuclear power plants will apply for continued operation by 2030. Uh, this slide shows uh, a regulatory uh, framework for continued operation in Korea. The continued operation system was introduced under the framework of PSR, Periodic Safety Review, with reference to the U.S. license renewal rule. Uh, the PSR system and uh, uh, the continued operating uh, system was, uh, were introduced in uh, 2001 and 2005, uh, respectively. In a PSR system, as you know, uh, the safety assessment should be uh, in, uh, conducted uh, at regular intervals, uh, uh, typically every 10 years. Uh, under this framework, the aging management have to be implemented during uh, the operation of nuclear power plants, as well as uh, during uh, the continued operation beyond its digital life. Uh, in this respect, I think that I can say that the aging management has become a living system in Korea. In order to uh, reflect uh, Fukushima lessons learned from Fukushima accident, the Korea regulatory body issued an administrative order uh, requesting implementation of 50 uh, action items. One of the action items is to uh, develop and in, uh, implement uh, an integrated aging management program. In response to this order, the Korean utility KHMP developed an integrated aging management program. And through that, uh, currently, each nuclear power plant has uh, one integrated AMP procedure and uh, about uh, 30 to 40 individual AMP procedures. The licensee also developed the IT-based system called AMP uh, implementation management system. The Korea regulatory body approved the inte uh, integrated AMP and inspects its implication, uh, implementation status and uh, results during every periodic inspection. This is a slide showed uh, a conceptual diagram of the IT-based uh, AMP implement implementation management system. So far, I introduced briefly uh, the Korean regulatory uh, framework for continued operation. Now, I'd like to introduce the recent aging issues. The first one is uh, liquids in INCO instrument uh, guide tubes. At three nuclear uh, power plants uh, in operation for more than 30 years, liquids have been found during their uh, planned overalls. Leaks were confirmed in the ISR tubes and they were detected in the form of boric acid precipitation. Boric acid uh, deposits were uh, found in one uh, curved section and found uh, in several uh, horizontal uh, joint areas of uh, ISI guide tubes. Through root cause analysis, it was found that the high chlorine, con chlorine content, rubricant, was, were used during seal uh, table maintenance in the past. The concentration of chlorine ions was intensified due to stagnation of the of high temperature reactor coolant, uh, and it is thought that this uh, created a corrosive environment. In addition, uh, microstructural analysis showed uh, non-metallic uh, inclusions such as uh, silicon carbide. It was uh, found that uh, the, these uh, non-metallic inclusions were introduced during the man manufacturing process. From this, uh, it can be concluded that the root cause of uh, ISI guide to liquids is a pitting corrosion due to uh, corrosible water chemistry and non-metallic inclusions. 
there are measures uh, uh, such as uh, uh, chemical analysis at all nuclear power plants uh, and the reduction of uh, impurity concentration through gravity uh, drainage and the direct visual inspection have been um, taken as uh, corrective actions. Uh, in addition, the, the uh, previous, uh, uh, the existing AMP was improved uh, by uh, conducting uh, effective BA, BAC, boric acid corrosion program, and by adding uh, local uh, water chemistry analysis. Uh, the second uh, recent aging issue is leakage from swing check valve hinge. Uh, in February 2023, a steam leak was identified from the hinge part of the safety injection line uh, swing check valve of a nuclear power plant that had been in operation for more than 22 years. Left, left picture shows RCS line, uh, safety injection line, and the check valve. Uh, steam leaks and cracks were found in the valve body near hinge. Through root cause analysis, it was found that corrosive environment was uh, created due to ionized, ionized lubricant and uh, stagnant reactor current between valve body and retainer. Uh, in addition, uh, it is thought that excessive torque was uh, applied because no specific torque value uh, was not provided in the manufacturer procedure in the past. Uh, it is thought that uh, the high stress was caused by uh, facing retainer and the frog bolt uh, with the excessive torque. Uh, through this, it, it, uh, it was concluded that uh, the root cause of uh, leakage is uh, TGSCC, transgranular stress corrosion cracking, uh, caused by stress and uh, corrosive environment. The measures such as visual inspection uh, using high resolution uh, endos um, uh, endoscope camera uh, and uh, uh, shortened monitoring cycle uh, have been uh, taken as uh, uh, corrective actions. Also, uh, some uh, improvement of the uh, design and uh, to, uh, to eliminate the blind spot uh, through the uh, design improvement were, was also taken. Uh, as a concluding remarks, uh, I would like to mention lessons learned from uh, recent aging issues. Aging management, management should be a, a living program. Uh, proactive measures should be uh, taken to eliminate the blind spots. Uh, operating experiences uh, should be uh, it reflected uh, into the aging management uh, in a timely manner uh, to meet the moment. Uh, efforts should be made to utilize today's innovative and uh, uh, clip edge technologies. The, and also, the mindset should be changed at the same time. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, panelists, for the, the nice presentations. Um, I think there's kind of a common theme throughout all of those is that uh, each of the agencies appears to be like uh, learning over time, evaluating operational experience, and then adjusting their guidance and requirements over time uh, to reflect that, what they've learned, as well as working with licensees to address site-specific issues. So. Um, all right, we have plenty of time for Q&A, so please submit your, your questions. Uh, we do have a few uh, pre-written questions here that we want to go through some of those first before we get into some of the audience Q&A. Um, and so the first question we'll, we'll try to ask uh, each of the panelists to address is, when a new or unexpected aging issue arises at a plant in your country, what is the role of the regulator in assessing its implications for the entire industry? And what is the role of the plant or industry? Uh, John, do you want to go first? 
Sure, and um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll be brief because I, I think I'm going to expand on just some of the same themes as I, I went through in my presentation. But you know, the NRC has a, you know, an operating experience program and we have uh, an internal instruction that guides that program. And for those that want to look it up, it's LIC uh, 401, I believe, uh, LIC 401. And um, it's available publicly. And what, it, what that program does is it basically describes the process by which uh, the NRC uh, collects, uh, evaluates, um, screens the safety significance of issues, and, um, and ultimately um, uh, uh, identifies actions. And, and those actions could be uh, anything from, as in the case of my presentation, uh, simply issuing communications to the industry uh, to ensure that they are aware of the issue and they can apply that experience as appropriate at their plant. Um, but the actions could also be, become um, something more broadly than that. For example, uh, 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 very time sensitive, high se safety issues, um, there could be a, a regulatory action, something as extreme as say an order, where there's an expectation the plant take an immediate action. But, but longer term, uh, the same process I'm describing, our operating experience review process, uh, directs us to look at our broader programs. Um, does, does that operating experience cause us to revise our, should cause us to revise our guidance? Or is rule, uh, change in a rule um, uh, justified? Or change in our inspection program? Or, or even longer term, uh, change in our research program? And so by this process, you know, again, we call it the LIC 401 or uh, LIC 401 process. Um, it it kind of guides the staff through all of those steps. You know. And, and, but outside the NRC, you know, we have, there is uh, the, the plants in some sense do the same thing, right? Uh, and and uh, the plants have, there, there is, you know, requirements that plants evaluate operating experience. And, but on in their part, when they experience operating experience, uh, the expectation is that they themselves also make that decision whether or not that experience needs to be shared with the broader, uh, broader, community, and they do that principally, as, as, as most of us know, the, the different uh, programs that are involved, you know, such as the INPO program to share operating experience outside of your plant as appropriate. And so as part of our license renewal review, we, we actually do take a, a look at that program from the aging management perspective. Uh, it directs the staff to look at the applicant's process just to ensure that uh, long-term aging issues, too, are evaluated uh, and as appropriate, you know, not only evaluate for at their plant that experience, but but also pushing that experience out to the broader industry. Um, with that, I guess I'll I'll just turn it over to any of my other panelists. So f first, there is something particular in France because we have uh, 56 operating reactors, but we only have one licensee. So this makes the landscape uh, a bit different from what it is, for example, for NRC or other, um, other regulatory bodies. So the discussions will be one-to-one -one, one -one between our licensee and the ISN. And the, the, I would say that the licensee's responsibility will be to, to take actions in order to, to assess the issue. Um, first, to understand its causes, then its uh, implications on the safety of its plants, and after that, to take the correct uh, mitigation uh, actions. And the role of the ISN would be to make sure that these uh, actions are appropriate, and if not, to make the licensee take the, the appropriate actions. So maybe it's a bit simplified to what you have to do in order to, I would say, share the information uh, that occurs on a particular plan to the other licenses. Uh, of course, the licensee and the industry uh, are required to investigate the root the cause, but NRA is very active and play a good role to in as assessment to identify the safety impact. And if the aging, aging issue is 
very important to safety. NRA will, may, uh, will use the back, fit, back fitting system because um, we have back fitting system and uh, re, uh, revise the requirement. And after that, licensee uh, have to allow the new requirement. And the recent, recently, um, Atomic Energy Agency, Athena, uh, sometimes had actual action to in response to regulatory requirement, regulatory request or an expectation from the NRA. So this is a recent activity from the industry. Uh, I think uh, uh, in Korea and the world, uh, a typical uh, role and approach of regulator is almost the same. Uh, it is they, uh, their, their role is to make the utility uh, investigate similar cases of home and the world, uh, identify the aging, uh, aging mechanisms, uh, inspect other, uh, other related nuclear power plants, and uh, take corrective actions. The typical role of the licensee and the industry is to take uh, the necessary measures and to disseminate the operating experience at home and abroad. Uh, however, when uh, new and unexpected aging issues arise, it is not easy to uh, find the root cause in a short, uh, time, a short period of time. Uh, therefore, I think that it is important to regulator, for regulators and uh, authorities to conduct uh, R&D appropriate to their respective roles. And in parallel with this, uh, I think it is necessary to continuously find and eliminate uh, blind spots through mid and long term R&D. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Sorry, move the microphone back. So another question that I think most of us on the, on the panel here might be able to answer is, as nuclear power plants operate for longer periods, what challenges do you see in preparing for and mitigating new or more significant aging mechanisms? Uh, start with Flavian. You want to take that one? Yeah, okay. Start. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges, and it may also be uh, particular to France, is that we have a standardized type of reactors. So there is always the possibility of an aging mechanism appearing and quickly impacting a lot of reactors and therefore threatening the, the, the electrical power supply, uh, which obviously makes things a bit more difficult even if the regulator is not directly concerned with uh, energy production. Uh, so I think th this uh, raises the uh, importance of, uh, of inspection in order to detect uh, the more quickly, in, in, yeah, in the more reactive way, uh, the, those new aging mechanisms. Uh, it is uh, very important to, to be able to, to detect them quickly in order to take uh, reactive actions. And for that, uh, I think, we need first, obviously, to take into account uh, French operating experience, but also international experience. As you have pointed out in your presentations, I think this is very important. We may not always be reactive enough uh, to share some information. Uh, I know you raised the CC. Uh, uh, and another important thing is that there will always be uh, some things we can predict, but there will also sometimes be some things we, we were not able to predict. And what we faced in France with uh, the discovery of SCC impacting um, a lot of reactors, sometimes with a high number of uh, cracks affecting some safety significant uh, pipes, uh, it was completely uh, unpredicted. And so our inspections, they also have to, to take some, I mean, to, to take into account the, the risk of finding something in some systems that are not believed to be impacted by some non-degradations. So I think then the, the challenge would be to, to have the appropriate inspections done on the risk, uh, on, on the parts that are concerned by some risk, but also to, to have a, a few inspections, uh, the right amount of its inspections on some other parts of the plants. 
So my thought is similar to Flavian. I think it, it, it's very difficult to find the unknown technical issue. So important is important operating experience sometimes came from the in, in, in service inspection, but it is made necessary to reconsider the traditional inspe inspection program because they, I, I, I don't know that that is uh, uh, appropriate to the LDO. So I think the safety research is important to uh, the take in the DO into account. And we, and NRA, it, it has many kind of safety research. I think it is very effective to find the unknown technical issue. Uh, in Korea, uh, the situation is different from other countries in that uh, the nuclear power plants are, are continuously being built. Uh, however, this is not only has uh, advantages, but also dis have uh, disadvantages. Recently in Korea, applicants, uh, application for construction permit, operating license, life extension, and 10-year uh, PSRs have been rushing together. Uh, to focus on safety significant issues, including new or more significant aging mechanisms, we need to establish a streamlined and more efficient process. I think that this is the most challenging one in terms of the review uh, process. Uh, in the technical pr uh, perspective, I think that the most challenging one is to identify an unknown aging mechanism in a timely manner. Uh, this is because unknown aging phenomena uh, continue to appear even though a large amount of data is uh, uh, accumulated. So I was, I was just going to expand because I think you've seen some common themes here. Um, this, this idea that um, we don't know everything and how do you, how do you uh, develop an inspection program when, unknow when unknowns may or ver are very likely to emerge? And, and so we talked about some different aging mechanisms that were brought up in this panel today that emerge after quite some time. And so if, if, if a, um, you know, it, it, you were all, we're all um, always looking to be more efficient in our inspections. And as, as, the, as in regulators, we're often uh, presented with proposals to take a, you know, more risk-informed approach to our inspections. You know, don't look at the, spend so much time looking at the components where, where the past uh, evidence of failures just isn't there, for example. But what the, what, the, what the struggle of the regulator is, is, you know, how do you handle the unknowns, correct? As well as um, the fact that, you know, some of our um, components have a very good operating history with no failures because, because there was a very rigorous inspection program in place. So if you have a very rigorous inspection program, for example, an ASME code program that uh, looks for uh, evidence of degradation and directs uh, you know, repairs in a timely manner, uh, you simply may not have a population of components that have experienced a failure. And that can, uh, that can be challenging because that doesn't show up as a, as a high PRA number, for example, as a, as a susceptibility risk. And so as a regulator, we, when we presented with um, proposals for, again, making more targeted or efficient use of inspections, we always have to sort of keep these things in mind. And, and that's a challenge. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for those responses. So, so multiple panelists here have mentioned risk just in, in that response. Um, and risk and being risk informed and using risk insights has been discussed a lot uh, in this RIC and, and for the many years set back as well. And we've gotten a couple of questions uh, related to risk from the audience. Um, so long-term operation, a lot of times focuses on passive components. Um, how, how can we uh, incorporate risk into uh, license renewal 
or long-term operation and aging management programs. Is there anything going on there? I know, John, <laughs> you're actively in the middle of, of evaluating how to use risk. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I guess I'll, at the, at the NRC, we're, we're kind of um, addressing risk in a couple thinking of risk in a couple of different manners at this, at this time. Uh, we're, we're thinking about risk in terms of um, we can use risk information to determine just how uh, thorough, I guess I'll say, or deep of a review the regulator does, like how uh, in-depth do our own regulatory reviews need to, do, to be for those systems that may be more or less risk significant. And that's an ongoing discussion we're having uh, with the industry now, and, and we are adjusting our processes right now to try to uh, uh, you know, tailor the level or depth of our re renewal reviews based upon the risk significance of systems. Uh, but, in a, but on the other side, uh, another way of thinking about risk is just, as I discussed in the previous uh, response, using risk information to actually shape an aging management program. How many inspections you need to do, how frequently you, you need to do it. And, um, and so, and uh, you know, I, I won't belabor it because I discussed it previously, but just the challenges of, of applying risk to a passive component that may have been very reliable over the years and, and using risk numbers um, to project uh, future failures of such components can be it can be difficult, especially when you're talking about very long-term uh, operations. Uh, but again, this is something that the, uh, in the U.S., the regulators act actively, you know, are discussing these issues with the uh, industry. So uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'll turn it over. Does anybody else have a, are you considering risk in, in your activities? You don't have to answer, but maybe some something on which I can uh, elaborate from John's uh, answer is that, of course, we need to know what are the actions taken when there is a risk that is known and if they are appropriate. But on components that are not subject to any known risk, uh, we still need to know what will the licensee do. And maybe one of the precise things to to look at is uh, what is the sampling rate of. Uh, inspection programs that are planned for those type of components. I know there are some rules in some of the, the codes as may as some basic sampling rates. Uh, in France, we don't have those, which means that uh, when you're not doing an inspection program on a, on a risk-informed base, you don't have any reference at all to assess the proper sampling rate. And I think this is something we need to think about in the next years. Um, because it's quite a concern for me to have a big, sometimes important parts of our plants which are safety significant and which are not undergoing any inspection at all uh, to determine what would be a good sampling rate uh, in the future. Yeah. All right. Um, so we had another question uh, come in. Um, I know this, it's addressed to, uh, to Jin Ho, uh, but I think Haraku uh, you mentioned this as well, but in your remarks you mentioned utilization of artificial intelligence and aging management. Can you elaborate on the potential and possible ap applications of it? Uh, that uh, I have, uh, uh, strictly speaking, I have no uh, specific idea about that. But I think that uh, uh, we can think uh, get. Uh, of tens of many ideas uh, from the uh, today's technology. For um, there are several examples. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, ISI uh, in service inspections, uh, most cases the UT technology is being used. Uh, the conventional one is using the angle beam uh, proofs. But nowadays, the phased array proofs are being used widely in other industrial side. Does I think that those kinds of technology can be used in the nuclear fields? Another one is to using the computerized data analysis. In the case of ECT of the at the current method, it produces lots of uh, large amount of uh, signals, data signals. If we use the neural network and the AI, uh, then so we can uh, uh, perform more effective inspection. Uh, 
Uh, and another very challenging one is to using and, uh, uh, AI eh, and, uh, pattern recognition, tech, uh, recognition technology. Uh, the uh, high resolution cameras are being developed to quite well these, uh, these ways. Uh, if we uh, use uh, the uh, pattern recognition, recognition technology using uh, the AI, then so we can uh, find more, uh, more uh, flaws uh, in, uh, 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 inside the uh, react first vessel. Uh, that kinds of things uh, uh, could be a good example. All right, thank you. Um, Eriku, did you have any ideas on yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I may have uh, something to share. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, something to share. But I, uh, even though uh, I'm not a specialist at all, so t take what I think with a pinch of salt. But as I think that the principle being I is to educate some uh, model on some data, I'm not very sure that it's good to predict the unpredicted. Uh, if you don't have any sign at all, if you, in the data you, you got, I'm not sure IA will predict that uh, there will be SCC on stainless steel in the next years, for example. So I think we need to be, as regulators, uh, careful about uh, the design of some inspection or aging management programs that would be only based on IA predictions. Okay, thank you. We just, start, we just started to uh, learning about the new technology, mm -hmm. and uh, we are collecting the information from uh, the other countries. Okay. It's a, it's okay. Our stage. Okay. Okay. Uh, a question for you, Haraku. Um, was there any consideration for aging that occurred during the ten-year shutdown, or because the plants were not operating, was that time assumed to have no deleterious effects? Um, it's a very difficult question. Uh, you, what you mean is uh, uh, impact to the mm -hmm. industry? Uh, okay. From a yes, from like an aging standpoint of the plant. Yeah. Um, was there anything specific you considered regarding the time that it was shut down? Yes, and this is my opinion, but. Uh, Licenses uh, uh, in confusion <laughs> just now, and they are trying to do something to, for, uh, for example, um, technical research, safety researches, and uh, um, trying to use uh, uh, risk information method to to explain about the conformity of the requ requirement. Uh, but uh, just now, uh, balance between industry and regulatory body is very uh, not equivalent <laughs> because uh, licensee wants to start the, their plant, but uh, we have very strong deterministic regulatory requirement. So I don't know how, what are the uh, licensee situation but it's very difficult to uh, explain about that. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, we, we've talked about operational experience a good bit up here and, and the evaluation of that. And so, um, so given the implication, the worldwide implications of aging management, um, how do you incorporate international operating experience uh, into your guidance? Um, and how do you share operational experience with our international counterparts. Um, John, you want to yeah. take a shot? I'll, I'll just kick this off. Um, so a, 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 few, a few mechanisms. First, first of all, I know there, there are you know, international operating experience databases that we certainly can pull from. Uh, but I guess I would say is um, one of our, I think one of the most powerful means of, of uh, utilizing international opera experience is, is, is some of the activities that Brian mentioned at the very beginning, the kickoff of this, of this uh, session, which is uh, developing relationships with our fellow regulators and, and, and international plants um, uh, through cooperative 
uh, wide, you know, wide cooperative efforts like the IEIGAL program, for example, as well as one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we uh, it's very common for us to you know meet in these large cooperative groups, but we we regularly meet with both foreign regulators and foreign plants. Uh, it's very frequent and it's, uh, to talk about long-term aging issues. And Brian mentioned just a few of the interactions with, with the, the countries that are here on the, um, on the panel. And I think what is, is most powerful about that is developing the personal relationships. Um, because when something happens, and I'll just use an example of, of the, the French operating experience where they had cracking. You know, what was our initial reaction to that? Well, that was to uh, have um, our senior technical advisor, Dave Rudlin, get on the phone and, and say, Dave, call all your contacts in France and get all the information you can get. And why was, how did Dave, how was Dave able to do that? It was because of all of the relationships that he developed through our interactions, and that's, that's made our participation in, in all the international groups, whether it's NEA, IEA, or, or others, uh, just really valuable. Anybody else want to? Yeah. No? Uh, totally agree your opinion. <laughs> so, uh, in, in Japan, important operation experience came from the personal connection, <laughs> mainly. So, but we collecting the uh, operating experience from the over, all over the world, and we make the uh, consideration or. Uh, um, resolution of the technical issue uh, to make uh, meeting material of the technical information review meeting, so and they provided to the licensee, and the licensee show the meeting material and consider the their action and put into the uh, PSR a safety review of the licensee, so. But it, it's very important to correct method, as, as mentioned before you, as you. Okay. Um, Jeno, do you want to answer? Or? Uh, in Korea, uh, we are uh, using many uh, different uh, or variety of channels uh, uh, for the operating experience sharing. Uh, one of the, uh, the uh, approaches to IA using the uh, through the IA IRS uh, uh, systems, uh, instant uh, reporting systems, that is a multinational uh, data sharing and uh, information sharing. So the, uh, the other other one is uh, the TRM. Uh, between among the three countries uh, in Asia, uh, including the China, uh, Japan, and Korea, we are uh, held, holding uh, the uh, TRM meetings every year. Uh, through that, uh, uh, in that, uh, one of the uh, important agenda of TRM uh, is uh, the uh, operating experience sharing. Uh, through that channels, we are sharing our uh, information. And we are using uh, the bilateral meetings. Uh, one of the good examples is uh, uh, the cooperation between uh, Korea and the UAE. As you know, Korea exported uh, the uh, nuclear power plants to UAE, and thus uh, we periodically sharing information with them. Uh, and we also uh, uh, use, uh, use using uh, the, our website. Uh, using our website, uh, all kinds of information uh, uh, is uh, uh, uploaded. Uh, if uh, the foreign uh, person are interested in our uh, uh, information, so you can visit our website and can, can download all useful information. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're drawing to a close here. I just want to thank my panelists for the, the wonderful presentations and the, and the insightful responses to the questions. So let's, let's thank our panelists here. Thank you. All right. All right. And uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the, the remainder of the last day of the RIC. <laughs> <laughs>